A powerful predator is stalking rural North Carolina. Whatever it is, is just killing for the purpose to kill. A mysterious beast that has struck before. A bizarre killing pattern. It didn't eat them, it didn't drag them anywhere, it just left them laying. All their throats were slashed. With violent attacks. The skull was actually dislocated from the spinal cord. And blood sucked from its victims. He could actually crush skulls and suck blood out of animals. A vampire beast that's returned to kill again. It has happened before. Monster Quest digs for answers. You're taking him out. Applies modern science to a 50-year-old mystery and makes a chilling discovery. <laughs> Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. North Carolina is a picturesque part of the United States, and its rural communities pride themselves on the peacefulness of life in this part of the country. But for many counties here in North Carolina, that peace has been shattered by something they cannot explain. In the last six months, more than 50 pets and livestock were killed in exactly the same way. Deepening the mystery, the killings occurred nearly 200 miles apart, a range larger than that of any known predator in the region. This wasn't no struggle. This was something like an instant kill. The thing is living in the, uh, in the swamp. It was very, very gruesome sight to see to see your goats laying there with their necks ripped open. It's hard to say what the predator is or what the predator's motive is. Whatever it is, it was successful at what it set out to do. Witnesses have described a dark brown beast, four and a half feet long, with a face like a cat, claws like a dog, and teeth like a vampire. Mm -hmm. These attacks are reminiscent of a killing spree that took place just over 50 years ago. In 1954, a series of unexplained and gruesome killings rocked the small North Carolina town of Bladenboro, only 125 miles from Charlotte. The way the beast was said to have dispatched its prey was chilling. He was where he could actually crush skulls and suck blood out of animals. Barry Lewis is the grandson of a Bladenboro resident who hunted the beast in 1954. If it's laid up in those woods, and if I take these dogs and come up the creek, he's heard family stories about the beast and the efforts to slay it. There was hundreds of hunters that came into town that you know just went through and trying to find this 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 mass beast. Well, everybody was hysterical. I mean, you know, parents wouldn't let kids go out at night. Doris Avant was nine when the vampire beast terrorized Bladenboro. Fifty years later, her memories of the fear are still vivid. Everybody was afraid that what might happen, and it was everybody was really cautious with their kids, and a lot of uh, surrounding towns wouldn't let their kids come to, to Blaine World. You could see the whole swamp was lit up with lights, big lights, big floodlights, and dogs, hunters were there with their dogs, and you could hear the dogs howling. For 10 days, fear seized the town of Bladenboro. I think this, this animal started off as looking for goats and dogs, but he ended up wanting humans. January 6, 1954, a 21-year-old Bladenboro woman walked out onto her front porch at about 7.30 p.m. She heard a noise, looked up, and saw the beast stalking towards her. It was only about 20 feet away when the woman screamed and ran into the house. The next morning, all her husband found were cat-like paw prints all around his property. The beast had vanished back into the forest. As quickly as it had begun, the phenomenon stopped, leaving only a trail of dead dogs and a lone, mysterious track. To my recollection, I don't think he was ever killed. Uh, in fact, this sort of worries me that he might come back. Barry Lewis's fear may be justified, it's been a little over 50 years since the original Bladenboro incident, and unexplained attacks are occurring again in the small rural towns of North Carolina. Local residents are left wondering, has the vampire beast of Bladenboro returned to kill again? 
Recent events support that very possibility. The latest killings are remarkably similar to those of 50 years ago. Local dogs and goats appear to be the primary target, with over 60 killed since September 2007. But this time, the killing fields have expanded and include the towns of Bolivia, Bladenboro, Lexington, and Greensboro. The predation is efficient, showing little signs of struggle. It's a pattern some claim to recognize and then discount. I get reports uh, yearly uh, on the exact same thing. Tom Paget is a biologist for the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. He often receives calls reporting the deaths of wildlife and pets, and he questions the possibility of the existence of a vampire beast. And I'm pretty sure we have instances like this throughout the state. Things happen like this periodically. And, and normally it's, it's just uh, a local predator. It has happened before and it has happened in other areas. But to think that there's some type of a, a large unknown predator um, roaming uh, the, the countryside, um, I, I find that hard to believe. But this man disagrees because he has a story that can't be explained. I didn't know what to say or, or how to deal with it. I was really alarmed. Bill Robinson is a resident of Bolivia, North Carolina, several miles from Bladenboro. In October of 2007, his three-year-old pit bull, Ray Ray, was one of 10 dogs found slaughtered over a two-week period. My son was the first one that alerted me to it. He was like, Dad, uh, something's wrong with Ray Ray. And I'm like, what do you mean? He said, just, you have to look at him. You know, he's just laying there. So I go out the back door, and I see him, and the closer I get to him, I can tell that something's not right. Usually he's up jumping around. So when I got to him, you know, he was flat out, and he was a little lower than he should have been. And so when I reached to pick him up, he was a lot lighter than he should have been because he was pretty stocky for a pit bull. What was left of him just came out. He'd been gutted. I took the body, and I untangled it from the chain, and I decided to take him and bury him. But then the gruesome story of Ray Ray took an unexpected turn. The following morning, the carcass of Robinson's dead dog was back in the yard. It was laying in exactly the same spot where it had been first discovered the day before. I found that kind of alarming because I know I buried him pretty far off and what would bring him back. So I buried him again in, in the adjacent field next to my house. This macabre twist has even the experts at a loss. Well, the fact is that uh, Mr. Robinson, you know, he buried his dog and the dog had, had been unearthed and, and something had, had drugged the carcass back to his residence. Uh, I, I simply can't explain that. The mystery continued in the days following Ray Ray's death. On the land behind the local church, Robinson found unidentified tracks, tracks roughly four and a half inches in diameter and without prominent claws, startlingly similar to tracks found over 50 years ago. This is where we initially found the tracks. And I looked and, and I knew right away they weren't dog tracks. I mean, they were too big to be dog tracks. We went from a bear to a, some type of large cat. And as the, we picked the trail up from further in the field, and as you can see, it goes further down to the edge of the field and it disappears over to the next piece of property. No one in the neighborhood left any children out after, after seeing the prints because, you know, living in a rural area like this, you know, you pretty, you kind of know what's here. Anything out of the ordinary was set off alone. So I have, a, I have here a, a picture of the print left on Bill Robinson's uh, property. Jonathan Luce is the curator of the Echo Museum, an educational wildlife park located in Montreal, Canada. With any print, you'll have the deepest impressions is going to be where the toes are located. That's where most of the pressure is going to be placed on the foot. When we draw out the lines of where the imprints are located, we can see there's a big spacing between uh, the palm print and the top toes. And this is a, a sign that's more typical to dogs. We can't eliminate cats because, again, we don't have the confirmation of claws, which would be an obvious sign of dogs. Bill Robinson is convinced that whatever the creature is, it frequents a nearby forest and swamp. He has decided to enter the area to search for more tracks and place trail cameras. Joining Bill is Tom Paget and Bill's cousin, Brian Gardner. Ryan is a local hunter who had seen the unexplained tracks. Oh, 
Um, just the main thing is find his tracks and if we can find out the path he's moving so we can photo or something, get some answers. After walking several miles, the three men arrive at the location where Brian first saw unusual tracks at the time of the killing spree. It's a logical place to locate the first trail camera. The type of tracks that I, they were were the same tracks that I was telling you that we've seen over by the church, the, the same ones over here by my cousin's dogs. They were large, yeah, round. Large tracks, round tracks, and they was you can put your hand in them. It's about that big. Okay. The trail cameras will be set to take a series of pictures triggered by anything that passes into their sensor field. Bill Robinson's motivation for finding the beast is the loss of a pet. The same thing happened to Bolivia resident Leon Williams. Four days after Robinson's dog Ray Ray was killed, Williams, a neighbor and friend, lost his two-year-old pit bull, Coco. It was approximately around 5.30, a quarter to six that evening, and uh, I heard the two puppies under the house barking, uh, fiercely raising sand, and uh, I kept walking across the yard, and I called for Coco, and she didn't answer. And so I called my son and told him something's wrong with Coco. I thought, like, maybe a snake or something had better. So, like, I, I said, I'll come over to the house. Leon Williams, Jr. lives less than a mile away in Bolivia. He knew how important Coco was to his father. When I got home, I went out there, and her chain was stretched out across the, across the ditch. And I called her a couple of times, and uh, I could see her laying there. And uh, I called her again, but she wouldn't answer. But by that time, I knew she was already dead. So when I, I thought, like I said, I thought a snake had bit her or something. She died from that. But when I drug up from the hill, I could see part of her shoulder was missing out. Uh, she had blood coming out of ears, uh, out of backside. Pit bulls, they can hold their own ground. So that made me kind of leery of how she's been killed, you know, without no struggle. Uh, she's not all cut up, you know. It was just an instant, instant death. I believe the creature has uh, very good intelligence. Uh, I believe the creature knows what, uh, what people are, uh, when to come out, when not to, when not to come out, and uh, I believe it knows how to keep its distance from humans. I believe it's been around long enough to pick a pattern. Leon Williams and his son decide to have the remains of Coco examined by a local veterinarian in a procedure called a necropsy. But before any procedure takes place, they will need to exhume the body. Yeah, I got it. And what they find is shocking. Is it Coco? Can't really tell. In the town of Bolivia, North Carolina, gruesome and fatal attacks have shocked local residents. Attacks that are eerily reminiscent of those by the legendary vampire beast of Bladenboro some 50 years ago. In October 2007, 10 dogs were slain in a two week period. In one case, the mysterious predator may have unearthed the victim pet and returned it to the kill site. This expert begins with the basics. There certainly doesn't have to be. Um, real unusual explanations for this. I think there's, there's probably some very simple explanations. Dr. George Feldhamer is the professor and director of the Environmental Studies Program at Southern Illinois University. He specializes in the study of mammals, a field of science known as mammalogy. The most obvious answer would be another pit bull. Pit bulls kill each other all the time. According to a recent study published by the Centers for Disease Control, one third of all fatal dog attacks are caused by pit bull type dogs. Historically, pit bulls have been bred for fighting other dogs, which often results in more severe injuries than those inflicted by other breeds. But the swiftness of Coco's attacker has Leon Williams skeptical that it was the work of another pit bull. If it would have been another dog, it would have been a sign of struggle. Uh, even if it was even if it was anything that would attack her, it would be a struggle. But this wasn't no struggle. This was something like an instant kill. 
In a search for answers, Leon Williams and his son have decided to have a necropsy performed on Coco. Seems to be intact. We're not even... Dr. Alyssa Travis will perform the necropsy. She has been a practicing doctor of veterinary medicine for 15 years, five of those in the armed forces. Uh, we're going to be looking for any crushing wounds, crushing injuries to any of the, any of the bones, um, any major dislocations that we might be able to see, um, looking for fractures, looking for anything that uh, might give us a clue where the major injury that caused the death is going to be. But before the necropsy can take place, Leon and his son are tasked with the removal of Coco from her shallow grave. With a few shovelfuls, Leon and his father begin the unpleasant process. 200 miles northwest of Bolivia is Lexington. Here it is goats that are being targeted by a calculating and unseen predator. And like both the vampire beast of Bladenborough and the beast of Bolivia, this predator is also capable of taking down large animals, silently, swiftly, and with terrifying ease. Are the malicious killings related, or are there multiple predators prowling the state of North Carolina? This woman wants to know. The first attack was uh, probably about two miles from here. It was at our neighbor's house, Gary's. Glenda Floyd lives on a 50-acre farm with her husband, Bruce and has raised animals for most of her life. The killings in her area are unsettling and unexplainable. It got their necks and just, it didn't eat them, it didn't drag them anywhere, it just left them laying. Glenda's account eerily matches the 1954 reports in Bladenboro. The animals killed back then were also attacked around the neck and left uneaten. Early one morning, Glenda went to feed her goats. As she approached the pen, she suddenly realized something was very wrong. Everything was still. She discovered her goats had been savagely killed. Their necks were ripped open, but the bodies had been left untouched, seemingly in the same spot where they had died. When we seen them, it was very, very gruesome sight to see. I remain very skeptical, you know, every time I get a report. Jonathan Shaw is a local biologist with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. He's seen livestock kills in the past and isn't surprised by the events. I do get a, a good number of calls uh, about depredations where people have lost livestock, uh, goats and cattle, and occasionally get sheep in this area that are lost. Uh, and I think a good part of the time, it is coyotes that are causing the damage. Large numbers of coyotes are found throughout the United States. They are present in every county in North Carolina and have been known to attack livestock. Typically, however, a coyote kills for food, but in Glenda's case, none of her goats had been eaten. Soon after, the predation continued to spread. The killing pattern was repeated in the neighboring town of Greensboro. More goats were found slaughtered on the farm of Billy Yao. Well, what happened the morning was is uh, we'd come to work and uh, the guys called about 6.30. I come over, we found four goats just laying in a straight row across the pasture. The bodies weren't mutilated in any way. They were all intact. And, you know, when we looked at them, it, it was really confusing about what would have killed them in this manner for not taking them for food. There was no body damage to where they had taken them down. It looked more like a bite into their neck as if it bit into them to, to either shut their air off or to break their neck. It's hard to say what the predator is or what the predator's motive is. Whatever it is, it was successful at what it set out to do. Photographs were taken immediately after the mutilated goats were discovered at both Glenda Floyd's and Billy Yow's. Wildlife biologist Jonathan Shaw examined them for telltale signs of depredation. The pictures here are, are pretty typical of what you would see in, in a coyote attack. Uh, coyotes typically will attack at the neck and will, lots of times, will suffocate their prey uh, just behind the jaws here. Uh, they could attack under the neck, or if it's a small prey, they may get the, the nape at the neck. Comparing Glenda Floyd's goats and Billy Yo's goats, there are certain similarities. Kay Cox doesn't share Jonathan Shaw's opinion. 
As a nationally recognized expert on animal behavior, Kay provides expert witness testimony in a variety of animal-related legal situations. She is puzzled by the photos and by the lack of an alert from the local canines. The fact that they were, all their throats were slashed, the fact that uh, th none of them were eaten, that's the one thing that really backs me away from it being a dog or even, even if it were a coyote, if the dogs in the area saw it, they would go off. <laughs> Could it be some strange creature that's out there in the woods that's all around? I suppose it could. Bolivia, Bladenboro, Lexington, and Greensboro. Is it possible that it is the same creature expanding its territory? And can the variety of landforms and habitats in the state support such a move? In North Carolina, uh, we do have a, a diversity of habitats. Uh, we've got swampland, we've got mountains, uh, we've got the Piedmonts, rolling hills, foothills. Uh, part of the state is heavily forested. Given the habitat, if there's, if there's wooded habitat, if there's swamps, if there are areas that um, there are really not a lot of people around and certainly not out at night, it's uh, quite reasonable to expect that uh, an animal, a larger predator, uh, could move undetected uh, from place to place using this kind of habitat that's, um, that has very few people in it. Um, that wouldn't be unusual at all. Brian, Tom, and Bill are counting on that very cross-country movement of the creature to trigger the trail cameras they have been placing. But then another oh, gruesome another discovery comes to light. Here. Could these be the remains of a victim of the vampire beast? The recent attacks in Bolivia, Lexington, and Greensboro eerily echo that of the legendary vampire beast of Bladenburg. Fifty years later, a possible profile of the beast begins to emerge from the analysis of recent killings, large enough to take down a 120-pound pit bull able to kill swiftly and silently without alerting local dogs, and with a potential range of at least 200 miles, a predator that kills for reasons other than food. Bill Robinson, Brian Gardner, and Tom Paget are searching the woods where recent tracks have been discovered. But this day, they find more than just tracks. Another skull here. This is a dog skull, probably a hound. Too big to be a coyote. Not much left. Like, again, there's just... Vertebra, a few, a few uh, rib bones. Uh, well, I, well, I know some uh, some people that was uh, some neighbors that was missing dogs. What I think is happening is this animal is killing these dogs off because he's marking his territory. It's um, it's one by one that and the dogs that's been killed has been by themselves. Their recent finds fuel their curiosity. They need to cover more ground in order to find more evidence. It doesn't take them long to discover another kill site. Here's a skull. They had deer. Um, they had nothing left but just bones. Hard to tell to determine the cause of death, but it's been here quite a while, probably since hunting season. Yeah, let's get on over there. Okay, before dark. Yeah. After finding two skeletons, the team continues deeper into the swamp. The expedition team reaches a clearing where Brian had seen tracks in the past. This looks like a good location right here. Okay. Yeah. I mean, everything comes together right here. Yeah. You got this ditch, you got that ditch, you got this, this old path right here, you got a natural crossing right here. You, can, you got the whole corner here. Yeah. You can be coming from wherever side. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? You want, you want to tie her up? This area is flanked on two sides by a creek and has a path running right up the center. This should have a funneling effect and send the animal traffic right towards the spot where they've set up a second camera trap. Okay. 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 There you go. Oh, 
After carefully digging around Coco's corpse, Leon Williams and his son have found the first bones. Dad, I think I got a bone here. Leon Williams Sr. is overcome by the experience. A Monster Quest crew person steps in to help finish the exhumation. The soft tissues and membranes that hold the bones together have rotted away, making it an almost impossible task. They're taking him out. Finally, they find a crucial piece of the skeletal puzzle. What is that? Oh, oh my God. There. What is it? The skull. Yeah. It is hoped that Coco's skull will yield signs of crushing, bite marks, or fractures, all telltale marks of an attack. With Coco removed, Leon and his son take the remains to Dr. Travis for the necropsy. As soon as they arrive at the veterinary clinic, Coco's remains are taken into Dr. Travis's examination room. Dr. Travis is looking for major bone damage, which may provide the most conclusive proof of the killer's identity. Let's see if we can see anything. So there was uh, large puncture wounds and... and the owner describes it as a two-year-old female, about a 120-pound pit bull. Whatever this was that, that killed this dog had to be, at, you know, pretty significant in size. Although nobody in recent times has seen the predator that is killing off dogs and livestock throughout the rural towns of North Carolina, many people claim to have heard distinctively beast-like sounds around the times of the slayings. Back in 1953 and 1954, the townsfolk also spoke of unusual wailings. I heard that he made some, some well, of course, crazy noises, uh, you know, squeals, you know, maybe like a baby crying. Can the science of sound help identify the creature? Monster Quest has asked Professor Robert Benson and Dr. Joe Fox to conduct an audio experiment with two witnesses who claim to have heard the strange, beastly vocalizations at the time their pets were killed. Working from the testimonies of witnesses and state-of-the-art technology, they will try to identify the creature responsible for more than 60 unexplained killings. That's the one that comes closest, in his view, to what he heard the night his dog was killed. The town of Bladenboro made headlines in January 1954, when a mysterious beast savagely killed 10 dogs by crushing their skulls and sucking the blood out of them. Women and children stayed locked in their homes. Men dared not walk outside without a firearm. Big game hunters from around the country infiltrated the town of Bladenboro. 50 years later, and the random slaughter of pets and livestock has resurfaced in and around the county. Could the vampire beast, whatever it was, have returned? Or has a new creature entered this area? The answers might lie with two residents who live almost 200 miles apart. Both Glenda Floyd of Lexington and Leon Williams of Bolivia claim to have heard unearthly noises around the time of the killing. Many, many animals have a characteristic vocalization that, if heard, could be accepted as conclusive evidence that that animal was present. Dr. Robert Benson is the director of the Center for Bioacoustics at Texas A&M University. His area of specialty is the evolution of animal vocal systems. Professor Benson has pre-recorded 13 known animal vocalizations. The samples have been specially chosen to present a fair and unbiased set of sounds to Leon and Glenda. Some of the samples are animals with the speed and power necessary to be potential killers, and some are not. Some are native animals, such as the black bear, and some, such as the tiger, are exotic, completely unfamiliar with North Carolina. What we're hoping to do is to play these sounds for the participants and allow them to score on a scale of one to five, one being low, five being high correlation to the sounds that they remember hearing. The recording 
of an animal vocalization can be considered solid evidence that that animal was present. Leon and Glenda will listen to a series of animal noises and pick those that most closely resemble the sounds they heard. They will not be told which animal sounds they are hearing. You came over to look at the dog. You didn't hear any noise in the brush or anything like that? No. Dr. Joe Fox is a friend and colleague of Robert Benson. He will help conduct the tests with Leon Williams and Glenda Floyd, collecting crucial data for analysis later. Okay, just remember to tell me how you, what you think, okay? Close, not. Cl close or not at all, or uh. somewhere in between. The first vocalization that Professor Benson plays to Leon Williams is a black bear, a known inhabitant of this region. Leon immediately dismisses it as not the noise he remembers. They cycle through each of the sounds. Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Then Leon hears one that sounds familiar. The one he's picked sounds too unbelievable to be true. He said there was a noise that he caught just a... The first armor. impressions are the, one that prob the ones that are probably best. What we're going to do is we're going to play the sounds again for you to hear and just need to let me know that one that you were trying to... You said you had sort of a recollection of. Right. That's You just tell me when and I'll write that down. And what we'll do is we'll probably come back and play that in more detail for you. Okay. Let's go ahead. Maybe I'll show you a quick sound like that. The one had a little distinct sound to it, but that was it. I think it was uh, number six. Number six? Yeah. This is about the closest, with a squeaky sound in it that I heard, mm -hmm. you know. That's... Leon has zeroed in on the sound of a tiger. How is that possible in North Carolina? Hey, Joe, did, uh, did Mr. Williams actually recognize any of those sounds? Oh, yes, quite a few, in fact. Uh, some of them are even some of the exotic animals, too, so. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think this gives a, a substantial amount of validity to his responses. Robert Benson and Joe Fox must now head 200 miles northwest to Lexington. They're going to Glenda Floyd's house to broaden the experiment. I think it's going to be really interesting to see if uh, the outcome here is uh, at all like the outcome this morning in terms of the selections that these these folks might make in picking out the sounds. Mm -hmm. uh, that would that'd be interesting if it if mm -hmm. it happens to be the same. Hi, I'm Joe Fox. Johnny Bridge. Bridge Joe Fox. Yeah. Hi, nice to meet you. Robert Benson. Lillian, nice to meet you. Robert and Joe set up their equipment. They want to simulate the environmental conditions at the time Glenda heard the disturbing noise. Nightfall is right around the corner. Yeah, this, uh, this environment is perfect for the transmission of sound. We, we could be three or four times further away and it would be crystal clear. I mean, this, this, they have a nice funnel effect of the sound. Dr. Benson and Dr. Yeah. Fox wait for nightfall yeah. and begin their test with Glenda. cat sound to it. While Robert and Joe are finishing their tests with Glenda, Dr. Travis digs deeper into the mystery. She is trying to determine Coco's cause of death, Leon's pit bull, 
whose remains have been exhumed for a necropsy. After we finished the x-rays, we decided to get rid of all of the dirt and debris that was there so we could actually look at each bone individually. And when we did that, we realized that we were actually missing some, some, some of the bones that were pretty important to us. Um, we were missing one of the vertebrae, we were missing one of the upper arm bones. Um, but we did clean everything off and look in the areas where we knew that there were supposedly injuries. We looked at those very carefully to see if there were even any scrapes or subtle wounds, subtle fractures that we might not be able to see either with an x-ray or with all the dirt and debris on it. I've got a small nick back here at the back of the head. It's not symmetrical on both sides. Not right there. Mm. Versus here. So, possible. I don't see any fractures here, around the orbit or anywhere. Uh, maybe got a little bit of blunting right at the top of the orbit on the left side. Gradually, Dr. Travis is starting to build a profile of the injuries and circumstance surrounding the death of Coco. A larger pit bull um, could have done this kind of damage to the dog. Um, another very large dog could have done it. Um, we've also got the question of wildlife in this area. Um, there are certainly bobcats around here. Um, I don't know if a bobcat would be large enough or um, ferocious enough to take down a pit bull. Um, the largest ones we've seen around here were about 40 pounds, um, but it is an animal with some substantial um, you know, claws and, and teeth and things like that. But could a 40-pound bobcat slay a 120-pound pit bull? Or could a single dog be responsible for killings 200 miles apart? A final piece of evidence may bring the mystery into focus. You think? It makes sense. Well, now we got the picture. In September 2007, a silent killer stalked the farms and fields of eastern North Carolina, killing livestock and dogs. 50 years earlier, the vampire beast of Bladenboro terrorized the same area, leaving a wake of fear and death. Is history repeating itself? Is the beast back? And what exactly is it? Monster Quest searches for answers. This man heard the sound of a big cat just minutes before his 120-pound pit bull was savagely killed. This man's pit bull was attacked and killed, and then mysteriously dragged back from its grave. These local farmers have lost over 30 goats and sheep. This biologist believes the killings can be attributed to coyotes, but this animal behaviorist disagrees and claims the range of the killings precludes a canine. Biologist Tom Paget and local residents Brian Gardner and Bill Robinson entered the woods and swamps near Bolivia, North Carolina, in search of tracks and photographic evidence of the mystery beast. Have the cameras they've placed captured new evidence that could identify the elusive creature? The photos from the first trail camera show no sign of a predator. Brian then compares the sample photo of the second site with those taken hours later and more taken throughout the night. Unfortunately, the camera traps reveal no further clues as to what is hiding in the forest, killing pets and local livestock. Could more clues be forthcoming from the necropsy of Leon Williams' pit bull, Coco? Should probably check the mandible, see if we've got anything similar. After six hours of studying the exhumed remains of Coco, Dr. Travis cannot conclusively say what creature killed the pit bull but she does have a better understanding of how Coco died. So cause of death could either be of just blood loss. So if the animal was, if the pit bull was attacked by the whatever animal this was in the area of the neck, um, it could have punctured the jugular vein, gotten to the carotid artery, it could have bled to death. Um, also, since he said there was blood coming from the ear and a wound on the back of the neck, um, depending on how large the animal was and how it attacked it, it's possible that the skull was actually dislocated from the spinal cord or there was severe spinal trauma. And spinal trauma of that high will kill an animal very quickly. Well, I think that would probably point more towards a non-domestic species, if anything, because, um, you know, if it was another dog that had attacked it, no matter how ferocious, um, dog fights are something that are, are sort of have a characteristic to them. So I think that points more towards a true predator. But Dr. Travis's findings that the skeletal damage is not consistent with the dog attack is consistent with the results of the audio tests conducted with Leon Williams and Glenda Floyd. Mm. 
Well, it's really interesting that the only vocalization in our series of 13 that registered with uh, Mr. Williams was the tiger, which of course is not a native to the United States. In the case of, of Glinda, she seemed very sure that the animal she heard was cat-like. She repeated that several times. The uh, native cats to, to North America have a little bit different vocal structure than the big cats from Africa. Although, to my mind, there are similarities between the two. And historical accounts of sounds heard in the 1950s support the possibility of a large cat. Could the vampire beast be a cougar, sometimes called a mountain lion? The stealth, swiftness, killing style, and sounds all point to this apex predator of North America. Tom Paget is familiar with this creature, but for him, one factor doesn't add up. A cougar would have the strength to, to take any dog. But again, uh, all of the evidence suggests that uh, the cougar uh, has been extirpated from North Carolina um, due to tremendous habitat loss, logging uh, at the turn of the last century. There's really no documented evidence that, that mountain lions exist in North Carolina or have existed in North Carolina in the last hundred years. Experts generally agree that the cougar no longer exists in breeding populations east of the Mississippi and north of Florida. Still, people claim to see them up and down the eastern seaboard, a continuing mystery in cryptozoology. One month after Monster Quest's initial investigation, Bolivia residents Bill Robinson and Brian Gardner received a startling cell phone photo and contacted the team. With the shocking new evidence, the decades-old mystery may be closer than ever to being solved. The photographer, who wishes to remain anonymous, happened upon the creature less than a mile from the homes of Bill Robinson and Leon Williams. Grabbing his cell phone, he only managed to capture a single image. Although Monster Quest has not authenticated the photo, there is no doubt about the identity of the creature. The size of the head in relation to the body, the thick black-tipped tail, the dark snout and lighter chest, all are characteristics of a cougar. Could this photographic evidence be proof of the return of the cougar, believed to have been extirpated from the eastern seaboard? Bill Robinson and Brian Gardner examined the photo from where the first tracks were initially discovered. There's Lewis Loop, and then we're here, and then there's Leon's. It's almost, it's in a triangle. I mean, it's, well, roughly a circle, it depends on how you look at it, but that makes sense in, in the territorial aspect of it, him moving here and moving there. There's plenty of habitat there to support it. I remember some of the research that I've been doing, looking it up, you know, they can support like 60 up to 80, sometimes more than mile, a mile range, 80 to 120 mile range, just one cat. But I think that, you know, with the way the animals seem to be on the rise and the comeback, because, you know, they've been around here like 100 years ago, they thrived. You know, who's to say that they didn't all disappear? They've they still been around here. I'm positive that it was a coup. And from all the research we've done in, in over the past several months, it, yeah, I think that's what's been doing, you know? Yeah. You know now we've got the picture, you know? Yeah, it makes sense. You see the picture and then the tracks that we found and so forth. Yeah. And it just all ties in together. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm not, you know, I'm not surprised at all, not anymore. Is the cougar back in North Carolina? Has enough evidence been collected to end the mystery? Monster Quest has shed light on the possibility and shown that the America we live in is still very wild. Some says coyotes, some says dogs, some says maybe other. I don't know what the other would be because in this area, there's no indication of any other. I can't say for sure um, that uh, something unknown to science hasn't been killing these animals.
something is terrorizing the southern United States. I just thought, oh no, she's going to tear me to pieces. A creature not known for its massive size may be reaching monstrous proportions. They'll kill you. They'll eat you. Eyewitnesses claim to see hogs 10 feet long and weighing half a ton. When you start seeing tracks as big as my hand, you know you got a monster hog. Are they enormous escaped farm animals or giant wild hogs? Put the first couple rounds in. Didn't phase him. He just kept coming. Monster Quest will launch an expedition to decipher the evidence. We want a monster hog. That's the thrill of going to check the trap. And apply groundbreaking science in an attempt to find a mega hog. You guys ready to let him go? Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. The southern United States is a sportsman's paradise, home to trophy fish, fowl, deer, and bear. But there's something else here. People are seeing a monster of epic proportions. Mega-sized hogs said to be half a ton, with razor-sharp tusks and nearly impenetrable hides, terrorizing local farmers and hunters. With an exploding population, these omnivorous and aggressive giants are being reported across the country. He really didn't even look like a pig. It looked like some kind of monster. When he threw up his head, hooked my boot, he jerked back, and my feet were off the ground. I had no idea they were the size of this one. You hear him growling at you and, and uh, grunting and, you know, coming at you full blast. His tusk came this way, and it just flapped his skin up, pant, everything. I'd never in my life seen anything this big. Most eyewitnesses describe the monster as similar in proportion to their normal-sized brethren, but up to four times bigger. Weights can exceed a half a ton. The most dangerous part of the hog is their mouth and tusks. Up to six inches long and razor sharp, these tusks have been said to rip through flesh like a knife. The history of giant hogs dates back millions of years. Archaeotherium, a member of the extinct Entelodon family, is a genus of a giant pig that roamed the forests of North America some 20 to 30 million years ago, standing as tall as six feet at the shoulder and armed with powerful jaws and teeth. Entelodonts resembled modern-day pigs and had very few foes. Some of the entelodonts got as big as, as modern-day rhinos, just massive animals. Jack Mayer is a wildlife ecologist with Savannah River National Laboratory and has been studying hogs for the last 35 years. There were giant hogs, the entelodonts, sort of cousins to the true pigs. Uh, that was a, a parallel evolutionary line that, his, that, that went extinct. There are no longer any entelodonts around. But could living relics of these prehistoric monsters be responsible for the recent escalation in encounters in the southern United States? In 2004, a monster-sized hog was shot near Alapaha, Georgia. Dubbed Hogzilla by the national media, it was estimated to be over 12 feet long and weigh 1,000 pounds. In another incident that same year near Leesburg, Florida, an estimated 1,100-pound hog was shot and killed by an Orlando fireman. The story quickly spread over the internet with the usual blending of fact and fiction. And in early 2007, just outside Anniston, Alabama, this mega hog was shot and killed by an 11-year-old boy. The weight was an unconfirmed 1,051 pounds. And the mega hog sightings continue. In Fayetteville, Georgia, William Kersey encountered another beast. My wife and son was running errands. They seen the hog when they drove by. They pulled up just because they was amazed at the size of him. And a gentleman approached them, asking them if they knew anybody that would, would shoot this hog. Kersey's son volunteered him for the job. I mentioned to him that I was going to get a 22. And he said, no, nah, Dad, this thing is way too big for a 22. So I grabbed my deer rifle, and I loaded it with four bullets. That's all it would hold. So. I wasn't sure what I was getting into until I got around there. Of course, I had to get my crutch. I had a broken leg, got up to the where the hog was at as quickly as possible. And when I got at the truck, when I seen the hog, I got out on my side, which is the side the hog was on. I didn't know whether he may come after me or whether he would run. And I wasn't in no position to be running, so I had to make a decision real quick. 
I shot the hog before anybody even knew I was going to shoot. This picture, taken by Kersey's neighbor, shows a creature of unnatural proportions. Its head so large that it spills out of the bucket of a front loader. I knew it was a hog, it was obvious, but I'd never in my life seen anything this big. The Kersey hog was officially weighed in at a transfer station at 1,100 pounds, but experts are skeptical of these mega hog stories and suggest that the big hogs are no more than pen-fed pigs that have been raised to massive size and then escaped. You have to remember, a wild pig or a wild hog uh, has a pretty tough life. There's a lot of food out there, but it's not high quality food. And they're having to constantly work to find what kind of nourishment they can to get by. But typically, it's, it's not enough that's going to allow them to achieve any large size, any large body size. Domestic pigs, on the other hand, they actually do achieve those sizes quite commonly. In, in captivity. The largest pen-fed hog on record lived in 1933. Big Bill weighed 2,552 pounds, the same as a full-grown black rhino. Raised to display their massive size, pen-fed giants like Big Bill tend to be docile while captive. While it's possible some may have escaped or been released into the wild, these man-made beasts pose less of a threat than a true wild mega-hog. Mayor will examine the skull of the Kersey hog to determine its origin a farm pen, or the wild rolling hills of central Georgia. For Monster Quest, it's a distinction that's critical. This is one that was shot by Bill Kersey in Fayette County, Georgia. This is an animal that, based on its anatomy, looks just like a domestic pig. Very large skull, a dished dorsal profile, and a very wide skull. If you look at the incisors down here in the front, they're very separated. In most wild pigs, pigs that are born in the wild and grow to physical maturity in the wild, those lower incisors are absolutely up against each other like that. When you get an animal that's born in a pen, that's raised on a very high plane of nutrition, you get this separation of those incisors. Looking at the physical characteristics of this animal, they are 100% consistent with an animal that was born in a pen and raised to physical maturity in a pen. But then how do you explain the beast in this picture? With its sharp tusks and a body dwarfing its hunters, is this a true monster? In 2002 near Plaska, Texas, about 300 miles northwest of Dallas, Oren Don Malloy claims he killed this megahog, a monster he contends was over 700 pounds. Furthermore, he asserts it wasn't pen raised, it was wild. When we stepped to the edge of the brush line, he was there literally just a few yards. He looked up and snapped his tusk a couple times, and here he came. I mean, instantly. He closed the distance, you know, just in a split second. Got the first couple of rounds in, didn't face it. He just kept coming. As a matter of fact, it may have sped him up a little bit. We were actually on the trail where he came out, and he was coming back down that trail just, just to get back in the brush and there wasn't anything going to stop him. Uh, I put number three, number four, and number five in as he was coming, and uh, it didn't slow him down much at all. Just a few feet before he got to us, he turned just a little bit, and I put number six in him, and he just folded up right there. We were just kind of stunned at how fast that all took place, and then at the size of him, I mean, he looked like a young horse. And just uh, being, well, stupid, for the back, lack of a better term, I just threw one leg over him and sat down on him like a horse. And uh, when I did that, he let out this deep, guttural grunt and jumped up and took off with me on his back. <laughs> and I rolled off to the right, and Toby put number seven in him on the left. And that's it. Texas is said to have the largest wild hog population in the United States. With recent evidence of resident giant hogs, it is here that two Monster Quest teams will launch their search. The first team is led by Kevin Ryer and Tim Hicks. Together, they have nearly 40 years of hog hunting experience. They will focus their search an hour east of Dallas, near Quinlan, Texas, an area well known for its huge hogs. 
shot a few that I just couldn't get them weighed. Nothing, none of the scales around here would, would weigh them. They were, you know, it, was, it would top the scale. They will use scent lures, trail cameras, and live traps in their attempt to capture a monster hog. My goal right now is big hogs. Um, 400 pounds, 500 pounds, and hey, if a thousand pounder comes up, he's mine. 200 miles northwest of the first team near Archer City, Texas, expert wildlife trackers Mark Peterson and Bill Ramberg will lead the second expedition. A higher density of hogs in Texas than there is anywhere in the country. Whenever you have volume of animals, you have better odds of large animals. Texas is a new experience for me. Uh, the, the terrain is, is, is beautiful, and, and so I think it's going to be really, really exciting. Their mission, capture a hog, rig it with a video system, and set it free to capture footage of something much larger. We're going to take a small, high-tech camera, and we are going to try to put it on a live hog and turn it loose in the wild. For the first time, a wild boar will be equipped with an onboard video system. I'll tell you what, it's going to be some of the most exciting footage you've ever seen. It's going to be phenomenal to watch where a hog goes in this thick stuff that we can hardly get through. If the expedition is successful, the hog with the attached video system will rejoin the larger herd in the impenetrable underbrush and capture proof of wild mega hogs on video. First, they will need to find a large herd of hogs actively feeding, where they will set up a baited live trap to capture a hog large enough to carry the video system. But wild hogs are wary animals, fearful of humans. So Mark Peterson has brought along the perfect four-legged disguise. A two-legged animal, like us, can't get very close to wildlife. Uh, horses can't, uh, especially hogs, things like that. They're used to seeing livestock, being cattle and horses. So horses are a huge part when you're trying to make your way through the wilderness in search of wildlife. Peterson and Ramberg team up with Pat Canan, a game warden who has worked for the Texas Department of Parks and Wildlife for 17 years. Hogs are non-game animals in Texas, so essentially anybody can hunt them at any time. And since we kind of monitor all the hunting in the state of Texas, we're involved with hogs almost on a daily basis. Canan directs the team to some wheat fields where hogs routinely feed. What we'll do is y'all come on your horses, go straight towards that brush line, and then go around that south side of it where those deer are. Just as Canaan predicted, as the team rounds the brush line, they come upon a herd of hogs. That wind changed just a little bit, and that hog on the far right got a whiff of us, and. As you can see, they're taking off across that wheat field. They're not running real hard. I think they'll probably stop after a couple hundred yards. As Peterson and Ramberg get closer, one of the animals gets spooked. We were trying to see how close we could get to them. We got within 75, 80 yards. Uh, then the hogs spooked. They wanted to get back to their shelter. They believe they have found a herd large enough to have several candidates to carry their video system, ready to reveal whatever might be lurking in the dense underbrush. every foot on the way up here. The pig will need to be about 250 pounds, strong enough to carry the video system. They will install Reconix trail cameras to determine the best place to deploy the live trap to capture the Trojan hog. With the flip of a switch, the motion detectors are activated and the camera will document any activity within the viewfinder's range. With the cameras in place, Peterson and Ramberg head back to camp. Navigating the Texas terrain proves to be more difficult than they anticipated. Okay. 
Mark Peterson and his team are near Archer City, Texas, in search of mega hogs that have allegedly reached gigantic proportions. But in Texas, it's not just the wildlife they have to look out for. The terrain can be equally dangerous. Almost up. If he gets up this time, he'll be all right. Yeah. Just throw the gun on the side. Don't worry about the gun. I'm surprised he's not on his feet. Something wrong with your leg, buddy? Yep, 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 yep. Yep. The horse escapes the incident unscathed. It was just one misstep, and luckily the horse is okay. I think his front leg got down into a little bit of a hole. He got nervous, he pulled out, he stumbled, lost his balance, and now he was stuck in between some rocks. With the camera traps in place, the team decides to call it a day and give the horses a much needed rest. The inhospitable terrain of Texas can take its toll on man and horse. But hogs have adapted and flourished here since Hernando de Soto brought them to the New World in 1539. Legend has it that during the Texas Revolution in the 1830s, the Texans released their livestock and the domestic pigs went wild. Pigs being pigs, they go wilder quicker than any other domestic species that we have. And once pigs go wild, once domestic pigs go wild, they become known as feral hogs, wild pigs that are solely of domestic ancestry. Could descendants of these wild hogs have grown to monstrous sizes? Hog hunters Kevin Ryer and Tim Hicks are embarking on a search to find out. Kevin Ryer runs one of the biggest hog hunting operations in Texas. If anyone can find a monster hog, it's Ryer. My goal right now is big hogs. As a hunting guide, Tim Hicks has an impressive track record for finding hogs in the area they have targeted for their search. I was averaging between 300, 400, 500, you know, in a year uh, for the last few years. The team has gotten a jump start on the expedition. They've had their cameras deployed for six weeks. While they have not yet photographed any giant hogs, the images from those cameras confirm they are in the right place to find wild hogs. This trip, the goal is to capture a mega hog alive. They begin their expedition by setting up and baiting traps. You can use uh, all different styles of traps. You can use scent products. You can use corn. You can use mixtures of stuff. You know, you find a trail. You mark that trail. You corn that trail to your trap. You try to get your traps in the area that you know that them hogs are going to come. We're going to set up bait, which in the form of automated feeders. Uh, we're going to put scents around those feeders. In addition to the live traps, they'll use trail cameras to monitor hog activity in the area. The trail cameras will more or less tell me when a hog is coming, what time of day or night we expect to get him. Along with the trail cameras, Raya will also use a potent scent that attracts wild hogs. It's a pleasant smell. It's very easy to use. You just simply coat the bark of the tree with this oil, and this will help keep the hogs in this area for a longer period of time. That is your target. If you're after monster boar, you want a sow in heat to come here and spend as much time as she can spend because that's what the big boar follow. They're so smart, it just sometimes it uh, seems like, uh, it's like, oh, I'm never gonna get this booger. And uh, then, you know, all of a sudden you look up and you got a gate, it skates down and boom, there stands up a big one, you know, and those big ones are fun, but then the work begins. They get pretty mean when they get in that in the trap. While 1,000 pound hogs are dangerous, even a small hog can be ferocious. Tim Hicks will never forget his run in with an angry hog back in 1998. I went out fishing one Saturday morning and came back and decided, well, I better go run the trap. And I uh, only had one. And so I drove down to it, and it had about six little babies outside the trap. So I uh, I thought, man, I don't want to let those babies die. Well, I, 
eased up to the trap, and of course she started slamming into that trap trying to get me. And I thought, you know what, I'll just open up this gate and let her out. And I uh, leaned my gun over onto a tree, walked over to the trap, and she ran to the other end. I thought, well, this ain't gonna be that hard. And as I lifted up the, the trap, she went from the other end of that 12-foot trap, she picked that gate up, and she cut me open right here in the lower of the butt. I thought, oh, crap. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't know what to think. I didn't have time to think. I, the only thing I knew to do was get where she couldn't get me. I panicked and, you know, I just started getting up and I just thought, oh no, she's gonna tear me to pieces. And the last thing I remember before I passed out was her circling that trap trying to get me. And I woke up and there was blood, you know, all in the trap. My pants were, were soaked with blood. I just uh, got in the truck, drove myself on to the hospital. If I would have fell down, uh, there's no telling. I, I don't know. She probably would have just got her, her piglets and, and gone. I don't I don't know. I wouldn't I don't want to know. Trapping the saw with piglets is something Mark Peterson and Bill Ramberg are hoping to avoid by scouting first with their trail cameras. They are near Arch City, Texas, trying to determine the best area in which to place their live traps to capture a hog large enough to carry the video system. Let's take this card back to our camp here and see if we've got any hogs here to play with. Oh, that is a big hog. He's coming right up to that, that four foot tall tape mark. I think we should probably have Daryl put that trap down on that bait. Darrell Wines has been handling hogs since he was a boy and is the lead hog wrangler on this expedition. Now that Peterson has identified an active hog location, it is up to Wines to prepare the trap. When I heard y'all was coming to put a camera on, on a hog and uh, see what happened, this just sounded like something I needed to be part of. I'm gonna back down in there and set this trap out. With Darrell Wine's task complete, Peterson will monitor the trap from a nearby blind. They're probably gonna go around and check some of the other areas for food. And when they don't find any food anywhere else, they're gonna come here. He doesn't have long to wait. Just as Peterson predicted, the hogs arrive. The question is, will they enter the trap? In the southern United States, a monster is said to be roaming free and putting fear into those who come in contact with it. Hogs as big as half a ton or more, with razor-sharp tusks and a body of armor. Are they escaped animals engineered to be far bigger than Mother Nature intended? Or, more startling, are they huge wild hogs part of a growing population? Establishing the origin of these mega hogs is key. Jack Mayer is one of the country's leading experts on hogs and is able to determine by examining the animal's skull whether a hog has been born and raised in the wild or raised in captivity, then released. The differences in the skull between domestic and wild pigs are first and foremost size. Domestic pig skulls are much larger than, than wild pig skulls. Also, the, the dorsal profile of the skull, the top of the skull in domestic pigs is is very concave. And this is something that relates to the, the level of nutrition that that animal grew to physical maturity on. Oren Don Malloy has agreed to have Jack Mayer examine the skull of the hog he killed in 2002. If this truly is a wild pig, this is this will be the largest really wild pig I've ever looked at. Mayer concurs that the features of the animal in the photo are consistent with that of a wild hog of enormous proportions. But an examination of the skull will be the determining factor. In addition to a visual examination, Mayer will take specific skull measurements, which he will input into a computer software system for a definitive answer. Kevin Ryer and Tim Hicks are hoping to capture living evidence of wild mega hogs in traps they have baited with corn. 
We're just going to check and see if they happen to have eaten corn right up to the door and we missed them because with this big rain, the rain would have washed all the tracks away right here. As you can see, the corn is gone. Uh, but if the rain washed the tracks away, this will tell us if anything's been here. There is no sign of hogs at the first location, only raccoons. Ryer and Hicks move on to the feeder trap. You want to run up to the pond that we baited up, set up, see what's going on there. We need to check that out, see if anything's happening there. All right, let's go. On the way to the trap, they notice a discouraging sign. The corn is still on the ground. They're starting to rot, finally. When the acorns are on the ground, it sure makes it tough catching pigs. Acorns on the ground mean a readily available food source for the hogs, which means the hogs might ignore the corn bait. Still, the area seems encouraging in other ways. This is a good spot because there is acres of swamp privet back here in a swamp area. It's almost impenetrable by a person. You, you have to literally get on your belly and crawl. That's the kind of areas that big hogs survive in, where humans can't get to them. I'm gonna set a camera up right here. Ryer has designed a solar-powered trail camera that will enable him to capture images of hogs. And that's the goal, is to get a picture of a monster hog. Hicks knows that hogs become more active at night and the approaching darkness gives him another opportunity to locate a monster. I would say your chances are better from just about dusk till, till 11, 12 o'clock at night, sometimes 2 o'clock. Kevin Ryer has also designed special LED lights that allow his video cameras to capture nighttime images with amazing clarity. As the sun sets in Texas, the hunt for a mega hog has only just begun. Two hundred miles away, Mark Peterson and Bill Ramberg's team are using a different type of video system in their search for the giants. The immediate goal, capture a hog, fit it with the video system, and trust its herding instincts to lead them to something far bigger. While Peterson and Ramberg have been scouting locations for their search, a team of scientists have been creating their one-of-a-kind video system. Come on in, guys. Hey, Gerald. Well, that's what I'm again, yeah. Joshua Millspa, Joel Sartwell, and Jeff Barringer are wildlife researchers responsible for designing and building the video system that will be attached to the hog. The system uses a low-light camera encased in a housing made of durable PVC. The housing will protect the instruments from the elements and from the hog itself. The video assembly will be attached to a harness that will be fitted onto the hog. The system utilizes two transmitters, one to relay the live video to the researchers, and a second to send a radio signal that helps track the hog should it exceed the range of the video signal. We've been doing this for the past seven years, and what we've been doing is we've been developing this technology for specifically for white-tailed deer, but we have interest in applying this technology to other species. The researchers believe this is the first time anyone has mounted a video camera on a wild hog. They've discovered that differences in body structure and habitat are obstacles to overcome when designing a system for a hog versus a deer. The fact that the hog has no neck makes this very challenging. It's, it's head and body, more or less, and we've got to put a harness on it, and that makes it very challenging. We're used to a single collar. In designing the system, the team also needs to balance durability with weight limitations. There's a general rule uh, when you're doing, uh, say, radio telemetry on animals, uh, you, you want to stay less than 5% of the animal's weight. And so, you know, if you look at a hog that's going to weigh 170 pounds, you know, we're trying to limit that less than 7 pounds for the whole package. As the researchers finish assembling the video system, Daryl Wines and Mark Peterson check the trap. You got yourself a hog. You can handle him. Oh, yeah. The team decides the best area to release the hog is in a small clearing just over the hill, which entails transferring him to a trailer for the move. Once the hog is in place, the researchers meet up with Peterson, Ramberg, and Wines with the video system. Now we'll rope us a pig. Okay, open gate. 
Grab that other leg. Just turn around and take off walking. They're not a real limber animal. They can't bend in the middle and turn around and bite you. So if you got a hold of his tail or his hind legs, just hang on and don't turn loose and you can stay pretty safe. Right. He's gonna bite, but just don't worry about it. Just, uh, you're right. Get it out there and get your deal put together. I got him. I promise you, he cannot bite you. I don't like the fit. I want it to be a little bit tighter. The team makes minor modifications to ensure that the harness fits correctly while not endangering the animal. I'm thinking that this is going to fit a lot better than I thought it would. It ought to stay on him for a while. Two hours? I'm thinking I want in on this bet now. <laughs> Finally, the team applies a hog attractant to the animal to increase its chances of meeting up with a large boar. We've got a good image, we've got good audio. You guys ready to let him go? Yes, sir. If the mega hogs that people are reporting exist, they may be increasing in number along with the rest of the wild hog population. We've got over two million now and growing exponentially. They, there doesn't seem to be any way to stop them here in Texas. The hog population explosion has caused crop damage in excess of $50 million per year in Texas alone. The crop damage, the damage to uh, just the ground is tremendous. They'll root up a 300 acre field in two or three nights and just completely destroy it. Their range in Texas has grown to the point now that uh, they're found in most of the counties in the state. And this is a situation that, that looks like it's only going to, to get worse with time. While attacks on humans are rare, they do occur. However, most attacks are the result of the animal being provoked or injured. Merle Smith of Clarksville, Texas, found out just how dangerous an injured animal can be. A friend of mine was hunting. He called me. He had wounded a, he called it a big hog. Uh, I went down where he was at, started tracking it, and had a good blood trail, but then it kind of got just a drop here and there. We were about to lose it, and I was bent over looking for blood, and all of a sudden, brush started popping and limb breaking. I looked up and, boy, this is going to hurt. That's exactly what I thought. This is going to hurt. The hog charged Smith, smashing him in both legs. At that time, I couldn't pick up either foot. I didn't fall down. It didn't knock me down, thank God. But he just hit me, and he was gone. I mean, it was that quick. A friend of mine helped me over to a tree, and I sat down. And we did what we could to stop the bleeding. And he went back and got a four-wheeler and come down there and got me out on that. Smith was able to make it to the hospital safely, where he received 67 stitches. It hit right here and ripped up this way. So his tusk came this way, and it just flapped his skin up, pants, everything. The doctor said that it looked like my femoral artery just rolled out of the way of that tusk. It was that close. Unlike the animal that attacked Merle Smith, the camera-mounted Trojan hog is not injured, but it is angry. They are a wild animal, live free all their life. When they get in captivity, their only instinct is to fight for survival. They've managed to fit the video system onto the hog, and they are preparing to release him back into the wild. The hope is that it will go into brush too thick for camera crews and perhaps get footage of a mega hog. At the moment of release, no one is quite sure what the animal will do. Turning him loose a lot of times is as dangerous as catching him because when you turn him loose, there's no defense. It's just you and that pig. And you got to turn him loose and get to safety before he can get up and get to you. You're ready whenever you are. We're ready to go. The signal is excellent. I'm rolling when you're ready. <laughs> you bet. Moving, is there a lot of movement or is it kind of cool? It's 
good? Good. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. The researchers have positioned the receiver up on a plateau in order to maintain the best possible signal. There we go. We are getting a little bit. It's a perfect image. It's just getting out of range now. The transmitter's range is rated up to a mile, but as the hog retreats into the thick underbrush, the signal breaks up. Millspa relies on the tracking antenna to pick up the radio signal. It's directly at that green building right there. We need to move the vehicle. We need to get closer. Watch this, too. Don't let me forget about this. Sending the signal live from the hog to our receiver. We've got to make sure that we know and are close enough to that animal to be able to, by line of sight, receive that signal. So we've got to be tracking it all the time. If it goes down into a, a valley and, and the signal attenuates, we've got to be able to know that, find it, and then go to it. We're getting a good signal here. Doesn't look like he's moving around much either. No video, there it is, right there. Oh, it's beautiful, it's still on her. The team locates the hog, nestled in a thicket. A lot of times these pigs like this, something new, it stresses them a little bit and they'll be a little uh, road weary or whatever, they may not want to travel much. He may have found him a place to lay down and recuperate a little bit, and it may be this afternoon, late before he gets rested up enough to travel, maybe tomorrow. But within minutes, the hog is on the move again. This time, heading into the underbrush. Hopefully, back to the herd to reveal where a mega hog could lurk. The wild hog population in the southern United States is running rampant, a problem that seems to be without a solution. But eyewitnesses report that it's not just the quantity of the animals that is a concern, but their size. This man carries the scars he says came from a giant hog's tusk. This man claims to have shot an 1,100-pound hog. However, analysis reveals it was a pen-raised specimen, less dangerous than those raised in the wild. This man says he shot a wild hog that weighed nearly 725 pounds, and his photo shows what appears to be a wild animal. This expert can determine if the hog in the picture was pen-raised or a true wild monster. As far as the presence of any giant pigs left here on the, on the planet, um, that would include only domestic pigs. Could this beast be a true wild hog weighing over 700 pounds? The skull of the animal provides the answers. This is a wild animal. You can tell by the, the, the depth of the dorsal profile. It's a very flat dorsal profile. The bone itself uh, between the sutures is, is very flat. It doesn't look inflated the way it is in a pen-raised animal. Uh, the skull itself is, is fairly narrow. It's not uh, broad the way you would get in a pen-raised animal. If you look at the incisors, the lower incisors, they're, they're very tightly placed together. In an animal that's raised in a pen, these tend to be spread out. As far as, as whether this animal was, was raised in a pen or raised in the wild, there's no question in my mind this, this is a wild animal. However, the computer calculations tell another part of the story. In taking the measurements on this skull and comparing it to animals with, with, uh, with known weights, it just doesn't come out being 700 pounds. But Malloy stands by his original estimate. At that time, we had a, our scale went to bottomed out at 300 pounds. We'd have to have them to weigh them. And he bottomed it, bottomed it out both times, 300 pounds. So, you know, you at least got a 600 pound pig and you kind of got to guess the rest. And, mm -hmm. Just from doing it so much and looking at them, you kind of you can kind of get close. And I'm not a fish, you know, giving you an official weight, but uh, a pig weighs somewhere around seven, seven and a quarter. 
While Mayer confirms that the skull is in fact from a wild hog, his findings cannot corroborate Malloy's claim. The Plaska hog remains a mystery, but Monster Quest still has two teams searching for living evidence of mega hogs in Texas. We want a monster hog. That's the thrill of going to check the trap. Tim Hicks and Kevin Ryer have focused their efforts near Quinlan, Texas. Found some real good hog signs, some wallers, fresh wallers, and lots of tracks. And uh, thought well, that would be a good place for us to, to, to maybe see a monster hog. They've had cameras in the area for nearly six weeks. The photos indicate they've chosen a good location in which to bait their traps. Now it's time to see what they have turned up. We didn't have any sign or any pigs in here the last two nights. Their first stop down by the pond comes up empty. All right, let's go check out another spot then, see if we can find them. Right, we'll go check this other one out. Please, Lord. <laughs> it's a trap down by the river they've been counting on. There was hog tracks here yesterday and bunches of hog tracks. And now there's nothing. Uh-oh. Birds. That's disappointing. Yeah. We're looking for monster hogs, and they're not showing up. Camera didn't catch them anyway. Hicks and Ryer's attempt to capture video of a monster hog using an LED night vision video system also comes up empty. A big hog got big by knowing how to survive. Uh, knowing how to survive means staying away from humans. Because humans pose such a threat, the Peterson-Ramberg team hopes to get proof of a mega hog using a captured hog armed with a video system. The animal has disappeared into the underbrush, perhaps heading back to the herd. I think that went really well, actually. I think the placement of the camera was perfect. We had a really good view from here. The camera looked like it was sitting well. You could just see the top of, the top of its head. You could see a little bit of its ear. So that, that all went well, so I don't think we're that far away. We can, we'll get close to it again here soon. No I'm signal? A, no, I'm getting a sig I'm getting a signal. I'm trying to get that harness off. If you can give me a general direction, I might be able to aim the antenna too. Oh my gosh, it's to our, it's over there. After tracking the hog for several miles, it's out of range again. Not getting any pings? No. Unfortunately, this time, the signal is lost for good, along with the camera. The Texas terrain proved to be more of a challenge than expected in tracking the radio signal. It's not clear whether the hog was unable or unwilling to rejoin the herd. But this time, the video system did not capture any images of giant hogs. Nonetheless, the crew considers the experiment a success. Well, you always learn something. There's something new you will discover, and it'll help you for your next project, even if you don't get anything out of this. As for the Trojan hog, a backup safety feature built into the harness ensures the animal is not in danger. Over time, the, the thread and the canvas will just rot. Like if you leave a T-shirt out on the line for too long, the sun bleaches it, and the, the weather degrades it, and pretty soon it just falls apart. Well, a portion of, our, of this harness will have that canvas embedded in it so that it will just rot and fall off. While this Monster Quest investigation did not find a mega hog, some remain convinced that giant hogs are out there. And there are giant hogs, absolutely giant hogs. Big hogs don't get big by exposing themselves to vulnerability of being captured. If we have two or three good wet years in a row, and the possibility of a hog getting that big is, uh, is really good. I don't know how they get that big, but uh, they definitely do. They do live here. You know, they have the genetics, they have the feed, they have the capability, and we let the age, you know, get them big. There's pigs that'll, that'll die of old age or nobody will ever even see because they have the cover and they don't have to be seen. While some have been proven to be pen-raised and either released or escaped, Others have yet to be explained. The question remains, are these man-made monsters on the loose, or is nature creating these giant beasts? People around the world report seeing something that scares them. Something actually pushed me from behind. And they say they've got the evidence to prove it on video. It did it again. In photographs. 
on audio tape. Voices that seem to come out of nowhere. I mean, I can hear that. You can hear that. Does brand new state-of-the-art technology finally give us answers? This is again another opportunity to scientifically prove your existence. Monster Quest investigates one of history's bloodiest crime scenes. Mrs. Borden had received 19 hits to her head. In what's been called the most haunted house in America. You gotta listen to this. I would consider them to be spirit voices. Witnesses around the world report seeing monsters. Are they real or imaginary? Science searches for answers on Monster Quest. More than a third of Americans believe in ghosts, that spirits of the long departed linger in the world of the living. I actually felt something brush between the lower parts of my leg. We heard footsteps right above us in the hallway in the kitchen. Out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw something blue passing me. And all of a sudden, my legs, which were draped over the side of the bed here, just started picking up on their own. Many of these paranormal incidents have been caught on film or video. Did anybody move back and step on the wall? This man says an unseen hand moved his video camera in a haunted house. You can hear and see that there is something physically moving the camera, but it doesn't appear on the camera. Well, I could see several anomalies uh, moving left to right, up and down. Right there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. This man Look. says his camera filmed ghosts on a Civil War battlefield. Look. There's nobody down there no more. A television newscast reported this amateur video might have captured a paranormal apparition right in the middle of the Vatican Basilica. And right in front of the tomb here, it's all clear, and there'll be a ghost coming up. You heard correctly, he said ghost. And the strange blue figure has become known as the Blue Ghost of Parma after it was recorded on an Ohio gas station security camera and broadcast on national TV. Technology captured this evidence. Can science authenticate it as paranormal? Monster Quest gathered together the most compelling evidence out there to be analyzed by experts for clues to its authenticity. So this is the sofa on which Andrew was killed. But Monster Quest will also generate new evidence, investigating what may be one of the most haunted places in America, the Lizzie Borden House, using the highest resolution thermal camera in use today. Um, we're gonna have to pay for this. All evidence will be submitted for analysis in a search for proof of the paranormal. Can't make much of that. A paranormal eyewitness may, in some cases, simply report feeling the presence of a ghost. But in the rarest cases, the spirit is a full-blown apparition, consisting of a misty, human-shaped presence, visible one minute, then gone the next. One of the most striking paranormal apparitions ever captured was shot on a Civil War battlefield in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We just couldn't believe what, what we had saw. We kind of figured it was paranormal. The Underwood family shot the video at a place called Triangular Field in the fall of 2001. There's another spark. You see what I'm saying? What's that? Looked like shadows or uh, something moving yeah. actually through the trees and, and on the field. No. Right there. Hmm? Uh huh. Look. They claim these are ghosts crossing the battlefield. Uh, they was actually moving in so many different directions, we just couldn't believe that we had, had captured this. 8,000 men died here over three days in 1863. Their battered bodies littered the fields. I really believe that it was actually uh, soldiers and horses coming up the field actually for a battle. Michael Goldsworthy, a former police investigator, will use state-of-the-art software to enhance this footage. 
the Ocean Systems detective package actually clarifies video and brings out details that you normally wouldn't be able to see. And more detail could provide new clues to prove its authenticity. The search for proof of the paranormal will also utilize audio evidence. This is the voice of a ghost, according to this investigator. It was captured using a technique called electronic voice phenomenon, or EVP. There's answers to questions. There's um, voices that, of loved ones that you can identify with. Al Rauber has been investigating paranormal activity for 40 years. He says the EVP method is simple. Ask a question and record, and voices will fill the silence that follows. Uh, sounds that aren't audible you know, when you're doing the recording, but when you listen back to the recording, there's uh, voices. Critics say these voices may be coming from radio broadcasts or that people are imagining a voice amid white noise. But for those who believe, it's not imagination if it's on tape. My son died in 2004. He was 16 years old and hearing from him was the most amazing thing I've ever encountered. Debbie Caruso is a New York woman whose teenage son died in an accident in Mexico. Soon after, she tried using EVP to reach him. I was really excited to hear that we'd be able to speak to them and didn't believe it. She used a simple program already in her laptop computer. It takes time and training and, to, and but after you record for a long time the voices get louder and they get stronger and now anyone can hear them my son joey left me this message on his 20th birthday it says ma i love you trying to communicate with departed loved ones is nothing new in the 19th century seances run by mediums became a hugely popular way to try to reach the dead But with the introduction of the camera, gathering tangible evidence of the paranormal now became a science. I mean, it's one thing for someone to start talking in a different voice or, or, or alleging that they're, they're channeling someone in, in that way, but it's quite another to see something tangible. Early paranormal photographs displayed everything from floating heads, shrouded figures, and even mediums exuding paranormal goo called ectoplasm. While most early ghost photos were fakes, this 1936 photograph of an apparition on a staircase in an English estate is still talked about today. The Brown Lady of Raynham Hall was arguably the most famous ghost photo ever. The house had a reputation for being haunted. And when it was developed, they had this sort of human shape. Taken over 70 years ago, this photo continues to cause controversy. People have checked out the negative, said it's on the negative, so whatever it was, they absolutely got a picture of it. They become legendary for being real pictures of ghosts, and that's all that ever happens. You really rarely read any technical detail on any of those photographs. But today, the technical detail needed to properly analyze paranormal evidence exists. Dave Manganelli is a paranormal investigator with nearly 30 years of experience. Ready, Al? Yeah. He and Al Rauber will lead the search for new evidence. That search will take place in Fall River, Massachusetts at the Lizzie Borden House. Location of the sensational double murders of Lizzie's parents, Andrew and Abby Borden. They are just some of the spirits witnesses say they've encountered here. The Borden case is really interesting because it was the crime of the century. Back in August of 1892. On the morning of August 4th, 1892, Abby Borden was upstairs in the guest bedroom. The killer entered and approached her from behind, carrying an ax, using it to strike her again and again until she was dead.
Downstairs, Andrew Borden had returned home and lay down to take a nap in the parlor. Someone approached the room, ax in hand. The first blow struck him in the head. He may have awoken to see his attacker, but it was too late. Again, the ax fell over and over. Lizzie was the prime suspect, but was acquitted at a trial that mesmerized the nation. And now, more than a century later, there are regular reports of strange things happening in this house. There is a lot of voices, footsteps, sounds, objects moving, things like that. My first personal experience in the house here was not long after we had purchased it in June of 2004. I went to the basement and I walked off the bottom step and took a step forward into what felt like a walk-in freezer. I felt what felt like two fingers being run down my back. And I, I stopped dead in my tracks. It's possible Andrew and Abby Borden might still be lingering, looking for some kind of divine justice all these years later. For the investigation, the house will be rigged with seven video cameras, all feeding into one central location, recording activity all night into the pre-dawn hours. Al Rauber will record audio, looking for paranormal voices. And Dave Manganelli will shoot with a new state-of-the-art infrared camera, never before used in a paranormal investigation. The evidence collected throughout the evening might prove the existence of spirits in this house once and for all. Okay, stop it now. Whoa, maybe back up. Why would this be so dark? While paranormal investigators specifically try to prove the existence of ghosts, sometimes the most compelling evidence is captured by accident, by ordinary people shooting home video. Every now and then, every few years, some piece of footage makes the news, like the, the kid who captured something at the Vatican in Rome. This video was taken in 2006 inside St. Peter's Basilica, by a tourist from Vancouver. And it turned up in a Canadian newscast. Watch this vacation home video closely and carefully. Did you see it? And right in front of the tomb here, it's all clear, and there'll be a ghost coming up. You heard correctly, he said ghost. Kind of see where the feet is. It shows a strange robed figure hovering in the air. That looks like his head. Videotape editor Shane DeBrasio examined the footage frame by frame. It's definitely clear in this frame if by the, the reflection of the light shows us that this jacket is being supported by a stick. There's a stick right there. Tour guides often drape coats or scarves on long sticks to keep themselves visible to their tour groups. So the famed Vatican ghost isn't a spirit at all, but just a marker in a crowded tourist destination. A gas station in Palmer, Ohio, was the location of another accidental ghost-like apparition caught on tape. It happened one night in 2007, appearing on video from one of the station's security cameras. I honestly thought it might be uh, a piece of uh, dirt or uh, when I first seen it. But others called the blue figure a ghost I see it coming. I have seen it actually flying into the camera system and stayed there for about 40 minutes and then moved from the standing position to the bottom of the screen. It, it moves up and down and left and right, but it doesn't have any type of set pattern to it. Mike Hamid, president of Automated Surveillance, installed the security cameras at the station in 2006. The cameras are infrared. Infrared technology allows the camera to see in pitch black conditions, which the humans cannot see with the naked eye. Hamid will construct an experiment to see if he can manipulate the image to recreate the phenomenon himself. 
Oh, actually, the infrareds have begun to kick on. Why would there be ghosts at the site? Some have speculated that the station might be built on a Native American burial ground. But a town historian says no one has ever found one. And the records have shown that for 150 years prior to settlers coming, and that was in 1816 that the first settlers came, there were no Indians living in this area. They may have at one time. Most of them had been run out and run off and killed and, and the like. Could there be another explanation? Are those who see ghosts merely seeing what they want to see? Our sensory apparatus is certainly quite fallible and, uh, you know, quite readily influenced by what we believe, what we expect. Professor Michael Lyons has studied the psychology behind paranormal beliefs. I think some people just are looking for answers and um, other outlets in our society may not as readily provide those kinds of answers. Uh, people who are more anxious tend to believe in the paranormal. Uh, people who are more afraid of dying. Another trait associated with belief in the paranormal is intolerance of ambiguity. That is, people who need answers more are more likely to be the people who believe in the, the paranormal. At the Borden House in Massachusetts, the search for new evidence is beginning. Al Rauber and Dave Manganelli arrive early to prepare for the night ahead. Paranormal activity has been reported throughout the house. In the basement, on the second floor, and more recently on the third floor, in the maid's room, and down the hall in the chimney room where a caretaker lived in the 1990s. Recently, there's been a surge of activity in that room. The first time I could actually feel an unseen hand on me, that's when it was enough for me. Tim Weisberg had his very first physical encounter with a haunting spirit in the chimney room. My legs, which were draped over the side of the bed here, just started picking up on their own, and I could feel the hands enveloping around my ankles, and that's when I said, okay, wait a minute, that's not, you know, the wind, that's not anything else, that's definitely, you know, something picking it up and pulling. In August 2007, Matt Moniz and his ghost hunting group were videotaping in the same room when one of their cameras moved by itself. The camera turned at roughly a 45 degree angle. Now when this happened, I thought maybe somebody had kicked the wiring to the, to the camera. And she reset the camera back to its original position. She physically watched and heard the camera pick up and turn, focus directly back at her with nobody else near it. It did it again. What? It just worked again this and time. I heard it. I was right here. Wow. I heard it. Manganelli will spend some time exploring the chimney room with the FLIR thermal camera. It is the highest resolution handheld infrared thermal camera ever made. All right, so this is the sofa on which Andrew was killed. The camera is normally used by industry and the military to see heat energy invisible to the human eye. We can't see it in the infrared, but the camera can. So if it's giving off heat, the camera will spot it. Now that can't be no well, it's nothing paranormal. Robert Matting heads training for FLIR Systems, manufacturer of the camera. This model, the most sensitive of the FLIR cameras, is being used for the first time ever in a paranormal investigation. So for people that believe that ghosts have substance, and if that substance has a temperature to it, then the camera has a possibility of picking it up. People report being touched. People report hearing voices that they can't trace a source to. And then, of course, seeing things, which is the most rare. According to accounts, Lizzie Borden's murdered parents are not the only ghosts here. It's believed that the third floor is haunted by the spirits of two children. Town history reveals that in 1848, in the house next door, another double murder took place in another Borden family. The mother of that family killed her two young children 
in the basement of the house. They were drowned in a cistern on the Borden property. And today, they're believed to possibly be haunting this house on occasion. Another spirit that seems to be inhabiting our third floor is that of Michael. Uh, Michael was a former caretaker of the house, and he worked for the former owner. And not long after he moved out, it's said that he died in a fire out in Connecticut. He fell asleep smoking. So five violent deaths. Are there five souls haunting this house? Can paranormal investigators Al Rauber and Dave Manganelli get the evidence to prove it? I, you got to listen to this. I, I, you tell me what it's saying. The Lizzie Borden house has been a hotbed of paranormal activity ever since Lizzie's parents were murdered there. The investigation for new evidence is targeting several key areas in the building. In the basement, on the second floor, where the family's main bedrooms are located, and on the third floor, the chimney room where a caretaker lived, and in the maid's room down the hall. Well, this is Bridget Sullivan's room, the Borden's maid at the time of the murder. And I had an incident one night. I was alone in the house. I came up here to sleep. And when I woke up in the morning, the first thing I noticed was that the little rocking chair that sits to the left of Bridget's bed here had moved around to here and was facing me like somebody was watching me sleep. The Borden residence is unusual in that all the rooms on the second floor are connected without a central hallway. So Andrew Borden's room leads directly into his daughter Lizzie's room. Well, certainly since this is the Lizzie Borden house, I like to put a camera in here and keep an eye on things as we investigate. Okay. Outside Lizzie's room is the John Morse room, named after Abby Borden's brother. This is uh, also the room where Mrs. Borden's body was discovered. Now, Mrs. Borden received 19 hits with what was believed to be a hatchet. Ouch. And, and where was that body exactly? Her body was found right here between the bed and the dresser. Al Rauber plans a variety of experiments. First, he'll use two recorders in an attempt to hear voices of the dead that are said to haunt this house. The recorders are very basic models, and that's on purpose. More sophisticated recording devices, uh, the way the microphone is built, it has too many filters in it. It filters out a lot of the voices before they come in. The finer does the design, the less it's going to allow outside of the box types of stuff getting into it. Tom Owen is a voice recognition expert. He was the first to authenticate Osama bin Laden's voice when a recording surfaced in 2002. Owen is an EVP skeptic. The bottom line is uh, I, I only make of it what I can prove scientifically. Owen will be analyzing any EVP voices Al Robert is able to record. If somebody brings me a recording and I can run the multi-speech test and the oral and visual cues appear, then I can state with some certainty that that's the recording of a human voice. Whether it's from the other side or not, you know, it really doesn't matter. It either is a recording, in my opinion, of a human voice, or it's not. Robert also wants to look for electromagnetic fields. Remember, for these things to manifest, they, they need energy. Monitoring temperature will be important as well. Those who've seen ghosts here sometimes feel a sharp drop in temperature. I have some remote thermistors. Uh, temperature sensing devices. I'll set three up in one room. The other room that people claim is always uh, very cold is the Morse room where Abby was murdered. Dave Manganelli is in charge of gathering video footage. He's got two roving cameras and lockdown cameras in four locations. The maid's room, Lizzie's room, the Morse room where Abby Borden's body was found, and the basement. Those cameras feed their signals to a control room set up in the Borden dining room. From there, Rauber and Manganelli can monitor everything that's going on.
Back at the gas station in Parma, Ohio, the investigation of the blue figure captured on an infrared security camera continues. Security camera expert Mike Hamid now has a strategy. This video is unique simply because it's like nothing I've ever seen before. We would probably want to walk up to the camera and dangle perhaps small items in front of the camera in order to see if we can get those infrared beams to reflect and see if we can get transparency through an, through an object. Hamid speculates that a bug may have created the blue ghost image. We've got three different bugs, at three different sizes, and we've got some different colors to try out. So we're gonna use these tweezers to hold these bugs as close to the lens as possible. Hamid climbs 15 feet to reach the camera. Its infrared technology helps it see at night. But when the plastic bugs are placed on the lens, no matter what color they are, they all read blue on the monitor. It's right on the lens. But what Hamid was not able to duplicate was the fluid movements and the transparency of the original blue figure. We tried all three of these right in front of the lens, and this one right here came closest to duplicating your ghost. But at the same time, it was not an exact copy or an exact match, so it's still an unexplained mystery. At the Borden house, Dave Manganelli sets up an experiment in the maid's room on the third floor. So, in this room, we had our story of the chair that moved on its own. So, I think I'm going to elect to use this camera, tether it to the laptop so I can see some of the video output, focus it on the chair, and uh, let it run for a while. All right, so the camera's on, and the program has recognized it. So, I'll just pull up a little video preview window. I'm just going to put a couple of markers that fall right under the right where the slats of the base are here. And we can check that later on, see if anything has moved at all. And we'll just let this run unattended for a while. Robert and Manganelli are monitoring all the areas where witnesses have reported paranormal activity. It's nearly 11 p.m., but the night has just begun. Okay, you gotta hear this. Eleven thirty p.m. at the Lizzie Borden House in Fall River, Massachusetts. Al Rauber is recording for Paranormal Voices. I'm gonna just do a walkthrough of the house, room to room, where the activities seem to be uh, more often occurring. Into Lizzie's room, I believe we do get some voices in this room. If anybody is in this room, this is again another opportunity to scientifically prove your existence. Now coming down the hallway to the chimney room, we've had many reports of things happening in this particular room. If anyone is in this room, if the gentleman that they refer to as Michael, if you are still here, please leave us a message on this tape recorder. You know how to do it, you can do it. The chimney room was where Matt Moniz and his ghost hunting group witnessed one of their cameras moving on its own. Al Rauber and Dave Manganelli sat down to analyze the video themselves. So it's and not. There's a few number of people in the room. Yeah, there's a good number of people in the room, so it's not unattended. There it is. Okay, camera moves. Okay, so someone is at the camera. All right. And they're resetting it. Trying to reset it. Is that good? so there's a wire on the camera. <laughs> Uh, there it goes again. It did it again. I just well, said that. It just I heard that again. I heard it. I was right here. I heard it. I mean, both times it moved, there was a lot of people in the room. Do we want to put a camera in the exact same spot and make sure it's anchored? We can try that, sure. So this is our corner where we had the report of the camera moving on its own. So in the back of it pivots pretty easily. All right, I'm reasonably confident if we don't stomp out of the room that the camera will stay there. Midnight. Robert takes down the temperature of the two rooms located on the second floor every 10 to 15 minutes. 
nothing unusual yet. Dave Manganelli returns to the room where the rocking chair moved. But our chair hasn't moved. Still right on the tape marks. 1 AM. OK, you got to hear this. Downstairs at the main control area, Robert is analyzing the first EVPs of the night. As soon as I say the word message, you hear, sure. Is this a message? Is this a message? Ready? Is this a message? The EVP a message? was taken in the chimney room. Is this a message? I don't think anybody up there was saying that. The chimney room seems to be providing the best evidence for analysis so far. Is this a message? The cameras are continuing to roll throughout the house, including in Lizzie's room. Robert believes an audio recording session could pick up the voice of Lizzie Borden herself. 2 a.m. To make sure no extraneous sounds are picked up, the entire MonsterQuest team and owner Leanne Wilbur are gathered in Lizzie Borden's room. Rauba will record on his two separate audio devices. We're in the Lizzie Borden room of the Lizzie Borden house. So this is the actual bedroom where Lizzie, not only did she sleep here, but we even still have some of her possessions in this room in a locked cabinet. Rauber begins the questioning. Lizzie, why did you kill your father? Lizzie, who made the mirror move? The mirror right behind me. During Rauber's last visit to the Borden house, a mirror in the hutch behind him moved when he asked a question about Abby Borden. Yeah. Rauber will analyze the recording in the main control room. 3 a.m. Dave Manganelli reviews footage from the chimney room. This is a review of the first tape that we did in the chimney room to test and see if the camera would move. So we'll just take a quick look. Okay, 10 or 11 minutes in, it hasn't moved. Almost 20 minutes in, same framing. So no movement there. Again, just kind of spot checking to see if anything unusual happened. And 50 minutes in, we haven't moved, people re-entering the room. So, nothing. Good, solid picture. Manganelli now decides to shoot with a flare thermal camera, which can see heat energy normally invisible to the human eye, including temperature shifts as small as six hundredths of a degree. With a really good infrared camera like this one, we can actually see some interesting images. And back in the chimney room, there is something very odd and unexplainable. And there's the chest on which the other group's camera supposedly moved. The bottom of the toy chest appears to be glowing as if it were blazing hot. Yeah, definitely warmer at the bottom. I'd like to go uh, see if it's as warm as it looks. The top of the toy chest appears to be much cooler than the bottom. Yeah, it certainly doesn't feel particularly warm, but... Interesting. The top is definitely cooler, so the object itself, so the top of that is, it does have its cool spots. The footage of the chest will be marked for special analysis. As the Borden House investigators review their evidence, Michael Goldsworthy has completed his work on the existing evidence of the alleged Gettysburg ghosts. It shows faint white figures moving from left to right, from the ground, then higher up into the trees. It was shot in 2001 by the Underwood family at Triangular Field in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Right there. Hmm? Uh huh. Look. To enhance and study the video, Goldsworthy used software called Detective. And then we just tell the computer to average up to 100 frames, sharpen it a little bit, and you'll see that it straightens out the picture. 
quite well. So we've gone from a very fuzzy, sparkly type picture that doesn't give a lot of detail to this, where now you can make this rock out much better. So then once it's been enhanced, and you can see right here, the image basically moves across. Could the figures just be other tourists on the field? Now, I do admit there were people behind us, that people just walking around enjoying Gettysburg just like we do, but uh, as far as in front of us, there was nobody there. This is the field as it looks today. In the direction the Underwoods were shooting, it is relatively flat. Yet the figures in their video seem elevated, well above the ground. For Goldsworthy, the repetition of the figures themselves was a bigger concern. So you have something in the picture, some object that's moving across the image, and it actually does it several times. So what I did is combine three different shots from different times in the video to show what I then began picking up as a repetitive nature. He doubts this existing evidence is a paranormal apparition caught on tape. Because of the almost perfect repetition, it's almost as if someone is looping either a video or a projection. As far as creating this, if you were to do this in the field, I would say that you would use a clear piece of Lexan, a clear piece of glass, and reflect an image off of it. But Tom Underwood stands by its authenticity. And if I did all this in front of everybody, I mean, I think I would have drew a lot of attention, and I think they would have came over and tried to figure out what I was doing. It is the real thing. The Borden House investigation has produced nearly 50 hours of new evidence from seven cameras. Next. Each tape will be examined in real time, watching and listening for any paranormal activity. We're panning around. There's a per, whoa, what was that? Can you back that up? Are there spirits of the dead among us? And does this audio and video evidence prove it? This family says they watched ghosts crossing the Civil War battlefield. Looked like shadows or uh, something moving actually through the trees and, and on the field. This man says something unseen moved his camera in the Lizzie Borden house. It did it again. The camera turned at roughly a 45 degree angle. Of the existing evidence, our investigation showed the Vatican ghost was not a ghost at all but a jacket or scarf suspended by a long stick. This blue apparition might have been a bug, but Mike Hammond could not be sure. And this expert was skeptical of the Gettysburg ghosts, but could not rule out the paranormal. It is the real thing. And it's, it's, not, it's not a hoax or anything. As for the new evidence, more than 50 hours of video from the Lizzie Borden house have now been analyzed by the Monster Quest investigators. Cameras were locked down in the basement, in Lizzie Borden's room, in the room next door where her stepmother was killed, in the maid's room where the chair moved, and in the room where the camera was once reported to have moved by itself. The hours passed, the tape rolled on, but nothing out of the ordinary seemed to happen. The conventional cameras saw nothing abnormal, but the FLIR camera did pick up unusual activity. It sees heat energy and shifts in temperature, invisible to the naked eye. Yellow represents a higher temperature, while darker colors represent cold. Here's the toy chest again, and if we can stop right about there, this is the investigation footage that showed that the bottom of the chest was glowing and hot, but the floor beneath it was cold to the touch. Thermal camera expert Robert Madding analyzed this footage. We're seeing this little seam at the bottom, which has a brass plate or strip across here, so not quite sure what that is. Could be reflection of uh, heat from people that are standing in the background. 
Not quite sure what that is. It remains a mystery. Next up, the maid's room, where there was a report of the moving rocking chair. OK, stop it now. Whoa, maybe back up. And why would this be so dark? One might want to take a look at, uh, is, this, is there missing insulation here or some other thermal problem? Because this wall is so much darker than this one. It may simply be a construction defect. So while the video evidence was inconclusive, there was a lot more going on with the audio evidence. We captured a lot of voices. We caught EVP in four of the rooms, the, uh, the basement, Lizzie Borden's room. Um, we caught it in the chimney room. And we also caught voices. I also caught voices in the Morse room. Now coming down the hallway to the chimney room, at one point in the chimney room, I was asking the spirit that we were told resides there if he would talk to us or give us some information. And a voice comes on saying, sure. Give us a message. Give us a message. Voice recognition expert Tom Owen analyzed the audio evidence. Let's see what it looks like. Can't make much of that. We're just saying total noise. Let me see what the, yeah, pitch is, there's no pitch to it at all. While this clip is not providing Owen enough data to analyze fully, there is another EVP that is. This one captured in the Lizzie Borden room. And when we finished our taping session, I mean, we pretty much had signed off. And there's uh, uh, some small talk going on. And a voice comes on the tape. It's very close to the tape recorder. And the voice is saying, so. Josh, he's tape recorder. Yeah, there's definitely something there, right here. When you whisper, you're not uh, moving your vocal cords, and therefore, you're not creating any fundamental frequency. And the first thing you'd want to do is to investigate who was on the site, because it, it, it is audible. I mean, I can hear that. You can hear that. And the voice seems to be extremely close to the microphone. But the surveillance camera in the room shows no one is close to it. Anybody that was in the room was at least three to five feet away from the microphone. This works on the, pro the uh, proposition of the inverse square law, you know, which means it's, it's a fancy way of saying that for every double the distance you move away from the source, you lose 6 dB. So if you're up right against the source and you're whispering, which you would, to be recorded in the first place, you would have to be close. And this sounds like it was close. The surveillance camera microphone also picked up the voice. But eerily, the voice sounds extremely close to the camera microphone too, even though the camera was 10 feet away from the audio recorder. You know, it's obviously a sound. I mean, it's audible and it's, it's, you can hear that it's a sound. Whether it's from the other side, I don't know. It may only be one word, but the investigation could not eliminate the possibility that this was the voice of a ghost. I'm pretty convinced that 90% of the voices that we caught, um, I would consider them to be spirit voices or of a spiritual origin. It may not be proof beyond a shadow of a doubt, but something strange was happening in the Borden house. and is happening in places all over the world every day. And as recording technology improves, and with it the quality of the evidence, definitive proof of the existence of spirits among us may be closer than we think. <laughs>